turn to the book of Romans. Uh, we are going to begin a study this morning that will be a study that will take us through this book. Now, you should know this will take us more than eight weeks, um, and it will take us less than four years. Somewhere in between those two is how long we expect to be there. Uh, if, if you find yourself at a church and they say, we're going to go through the book of Romans in eight weeks, uh, they're lying to you, Okay. What they're going to do is they're going to give you themes from the book of Romans, which is fine, but you won't get Romans, you'll just get themes from Romans. And um, so we're going to try to, uh, we're going to try not to hike our way through the book of Romans, but we're going to try to drive our way through at a comfortable pace, uh, hit, seeing the big highlights as we go on the way. Um, it may take, I don't know, a year, year and a half. We may take some breaks along the way, but we'll be here for a while, and I'm looking forward to it. This is a good year to actually start this study in the book of Romans because, as many of you know, this is the 500th anniversary of the event that is the immediate cause of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation. On October 31st in 1517, 500 years ago, Martin Luther, who was an Augustinian monk, living in Wittenberg, Germany, and teaching at the University of Wittenberg, decided that he wanted to start a conversation among other scholarly people. So in Latin, he nailed to the church door, which was like the bulletin board for the church, he nailed his 95 theses. It was basically 95 conversation points where he said, I think, I think we need to make some adjustments to what's going on in the church. He nailed that to the door. It was in Latin. That meant that the common people could not understand it. It was for the scholars to debate. But somebody, over a two-week period, took it down and translated it into German and circulated it, and all of a sudden it was the buzz, not just in Wittenberg but all around Germany and ultimately making its way back to Rome, and it became quite the theological discussion. And Romans, the book of Romans, plays a big part in the history of what happened to begin the, the Reformation because it played a big part in what happened in Martin Luther's life and in his understanding of the gospel. And I want to give you just a little bit of that as background and then Curtis is going to come up and tell us about the book that we're going to be studying. But I, I want you to understand how significant this book has been in the lives of some significant key people. Luther was born in uh, 1483, uh, his his dad was a coal, or excuse me, a copper miner. They lived about two hours south of modern day Munich. He was born in uh, Eiselben, Germany. He was a bright young man, and his father wanted him to be a lawyer. So when he was 13 years old, he went off to university. 13, he went to the university to get first his undergraduate, his baccalaureate, and then his master's degree studying to be an attorney. And at the university, he was seen as a, a bright young man. In fact, he completed his course of study in the fastest time allowed. He uh, was known as a great debater, and his nickname at the university was the philosopher. So he was, he was bright, and he loved to debate. He was... Uh, Actually, uh, right, uh, moving home, he was he was on a trip home to uh, to his his hometown in fifteen what was it fifteen oh five. He was twenty one years old. Fifteen oh five. He's he's going home on horseback, and he winds up in the middle of a thunderstorm, and it is a massive thunderstorm, and lightning is striking. In fact, lightning struck a tree nearby where he was riding in the middle of this storm. And he got off his horse, and he went to a place of safety, and he cried out, as a good Catholic would, to St. Anne to protect him. He, he, in fact, he made a vow. He said, St. Anne, protect me, and I will become a monk. It was one of those foxhole prayers, but Luther was a man who understood that these are not things you trifle with. And when he was spared from the storm, he thought he was going to die. When he was spared, he realized he had to honor his vow, and so he went to the monastery. His dad was furious. This was wasted education. Here was a skillful lawyer who could make decent money, and now he's going off to some monastery. But Luther had enough of the fear of God in him that he knew that you don't just make an idle promise and then leave it alone. 
So off to the monastery he went. And as he studied for the priesthood, he became very aware of the reality of his personal unrighteousness. The more he studied about God and about his holiness and about his standard for righteousness, the more Martin Luther began to recognize that his own life was full of sinful thoughts, sinful words, sinful actions, and Luther was committed to doing whatever he needed to do to purge these thoughts from himself so that he might become righteous before God. This is what he was being taught in the monastery, was that the work of the Christian life was to purge away sinfulness so that you could one day, with the aid of Christ, become righteous, stand before God, who would then, once you became righteous, God would declare you righteous, and you could enter into heaven. And this was the pursuit of Martin Luther's life. He was going to do whatever it took. And for him, that meant periods, extended periods of prayer, extended periods of fasting. He would not sleep with a blanket, thinking that the asceticism, that somehow denying himself, these acts of self-denial, would somehow work the sin out of his system. He, he uh, went to Rome and he climbed the steps of St. Peter's Basilica on his knees, pausing to pray on every step, hoping that these kinds of actions would someday, somehow ignite in him godly spirituality, that he would become the holy person he desired to be through these kinds of actions. And guess what he found? It wasn't doing him any good. He found that the more he tried the more he recognized just how depraved he was. And he was tormented by this. And the, the people who were leading the monastery tried to tell him just to chill a little bit and, and relax. He couldn't. He wouldn't sleep. He wouldn't show up for meals. They were troubled. In fact, some thought that he might have some kind of a psychological disorder. Well, he didn't. Here was the disorder he had. He read in the Bible that God is holy. He saw in his life that he wasn't. And he knew that if you were not holy, you could not stand before a holy God without, being, uh, without God pouring his wrath out on you. He knew what was ahead for him, and he saw no way to escape it. And the harder he tried, the worse things got. Meanwhile, he was ordered to uh, complete his doctorate in the Bible and become a professor in Wittenberg. And it was while he was lecturing on the Psalms and studying the book of Romans that he had the epiphany that changed his life. He began to see a way through his dilemma that he had never seen in the Bible before. And it came when he read Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Now, if you've got your Bible in your lap, you can look down at Romans 1, 17. Here's what it says. Luther read, for in it, and, and the it refers back to verse 16, it's the gospel. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God. He says, in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, I've got to tell you, I read that, and on first reading, that doesn't jump out to me and say, aha, that solves it for me. Didn't for Luther either. He chewed on that. He meditated on that. He over and over in his mind goes, what is that saying? What does that mean? Until one day he began to go, I think what this is saying is that the good news is, the gospel is, that the righteousness of God is revealed by faith. That's who, who reveals the righteousness of God? Jesus reveals the righteousness of God. He is the revealed righteousness. The gospel is Jesus is the revealed righteousness of God, and the righteousness of Jesus is given as a gift of faith to the person who will believe. And Luther, who had been trying through his own merit to earn it, had been trying to purge himself of his sin, looked at that and chewed on it and said, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? And it was epiphanal for him. And he 
his chains fell off, his heart was free, he rose, went forth, and followed Jesus. He began to declare that the Bible is teaching that our works of righteousness are indeed filthy rags, and that it is the work of Christ on our behalf, received by faith alone, that is the message of the gospel. He would not heard that. He was a doctor in the church, and he would not heard that gospel. Can you see why they needed a reformation? Can you see why the church was stuck? It was a breakthrough for Luther. Here's what he wrote. He said, at last, meditating day and night by the mercy of God, I began to understand that the righteousness of God is that through which the righteous life by, excuse me, the righteous live by a gift of God, namely by faith. I felt as if I was entirely born again and had entered paradise itself through the gates that had been flung open. That one verse in Romans was the verse that brought life to a man who had understood just how dead he was in his trespasses and sins. And that verse was the seed that began to grow and brought a recovery of the great doctrines of the church that had been lost in the dark ages. The doctrines that God's uh, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed in the scriptures alone, for the glory of God alone. The five solas of the Reformation, as they became known. So we begin the study of the book of Romans, hoping that as we spend time in this book, God will use his word in our lives the way he used it in Luther's life to, to stir in us a fresh understanding of the beauty of who God is and his glorious plan revealed in the gospel and revealed in Christ. I have to tell you that my own story is similar to Luther's. I had been actively involved. I grew up in a church. I uh, grew up going to church. I was in church most Sundays, mostly because of the choir. I loved singing in the choir. I was in the junior high choir. I was in the senior high choir. And I went to church because I loved the music. Uh, I also, when I was in high school, I started going to a thing called Young Life in our high school. And I went to that because I could, I, it was a school, I could leave the house on a school night to go to Young Life. That was the thing I was looking forward. And it was usually at the home of cute girls. And so those were the two things that motivated me to go. But it was at Young Life that I heard the message of the gospel for the first time in high school. And I remember thinking, this is, this is good. This means that God has sent Jesus to take care of the few things that I might have done wrong in my life so that I can get into heaven. That was my thinking. I've done a few things wrong, maybe. Maybe. And God had sent Jesus to take care of those things. But I thought I was mostly a good person. I went off to college, and I became a Young Life leader. I used to go into high schools and share the, the message of Jesus as I understood it with those high school kids, those poor high school kids, right? Because I didn't understand what I was telling them. But God can even use donkeys to communicate the gospel, and that's what he was doing when I was in, in college. Well, Marianne and I attended a Bible study in the summer after my junior year, and at the end of the Bible study, one of the uh, guys who was in the study came up to me and he said, could we get together this week? I have a few questions I'd like to ask you. And I thought, I wonder what he needs me to explain to him. <laughs> now, that might give you an indication that there was some pride at work in my own heart. We got together over at his little apartment, and I remember him saying, I think in these words, I don't think you get it. And I remember being kind of astonished. I thought, I, I have prayed that prayer you're supposed to pray at least three times. And I have... Uh, I, I've been leading high school kids. I've, I've gone to camps with them. I mean, what do you mean I don't get it? And he took me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, it says, There's none righteous, no, not one. Nobody seeks after God. It goes on to explain the reality of our depravity. And for the first time, I saw that Jesus came to rescue me, not from those few mistakes I might have made, but I began to see the reality of my own sinful condition. And that was the time, that was the moment that I look back and say, that's when I understood the gospel for the first time. When I understood my sin for the first time, I understood my go the gospel for the first time. So God used Romans in my life to bring me to faith, just like he brought Martin Luther to faith using Romans. And God used Romans in Curtis Thomas's life to bring him to faith when he was a high school student in Pine Bluff, Arkansas. 
So he's going to help teach us the book of Romans as we go through it. And that's one of the reasons I wanted us to go through this this year, starting this year, is because it's a Reformation year. But another reason I wanted us to go through this is because Curtis isn't getting any younger, right? And I wanted Curtis to help take us through this book. He has taught through the book of Romans at least a dozen times. He's done it in uh, living rooms. He's done it in churches. He's done it uh, on the mission field. He's done it to people going out to the mission field. Uh, this, In fact, Curtis has published this book, Romans, an interpretive outline, that is a help. We, we, we've got copies. If you'd like a copy, uh, we've got them for $7 out here. This is Curtis's notes going, looking at, the, at what the scriptures say. It's, it's like a commentary on Romans that Curtis wrote 30 years ago, 50 years ago? How long ago? 63. However many years ago that is, okay? So we've got copies of that if you'd like to get one of those and take it home with you. Uh, and, and so one of the reasons I wanted us to, to go through it this year is because I want us to benefit from the years of study in this book that Curtis Thomas has, uh, has uh, given it. So Curtis, come on up here. Uh, Curtis is going to provide us with the, the background information that we need as we get ready to dive in to chapter 1. Mike on. Okay, all right, thank you. Bob mentioned my uh, experience with Romans. I'll give you a little longer explanation of that. In uh, 1954, which was uh, 63 years ago, actually, um, I lived in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and uh, my dad was in the insurance business, and uh, he was a State Farm agent. And State Farm uh, would not write uh, a lot of folks uh, back in those days. They wouldn't write any black people. Of course, southeast Arkansas, there's a lot of black people there. They wouldn't write a, uh, a, lot, of, a lot of folks. They had very stringent underwriting requirements. And I had gone to work for him when I was 13 years old in his, in his insurance office, typing policies and filling out claim forms and so forth. And he, uh, he opened an office on the other side of town to take all the State Farm rejects. And he put me in charge of that office when I was a senior in high school and actually furnished me a car and... Uh, and an office and a secretary. And so I, uh, while I was my senior year in high school in 1954, I would get out at noon and go to the office and, and work for him. So my life was, was already planned out. In a matter of two months, uh, this was in March of uh, 1954, in a matter of two months, uh, I was just going to graduate and go directly to that office and start my ca uh, career as a high school graduate. But my brother uh, joined the Church of Christ. And my family attended a Baptist church kind of nominally, uh, but all through the years attending that, the various churches, I never understood the gospel. I thought that a person was got into heaven by their morality and by their good works and so forth. Anyway, when my brother joined the Church of Christ, my mother asked the pastor of the little church where we were attending if he would come over and talk to Bill and try to dissuade him from leaving the Baptist church. Well, he said, I'll bring, a, I'll send another fellow over. So the fellow came over, and my brother would not talk to him. Now, here I was, two, uh, two months away from graduating, had my life all planned out for me. And he asked me, he said, uh, would you be willing to study the Bible? And my first thought was, maybe God won't send me to hell if I say yes. And so I said, yes. And he said, could you gather up some of your buddies from high school and, and we'll have a Bible study? So uh, I did, and of course I, I, I didn't know anything. I couldn't find the Gospel of John or Romans or Genesis or anything in the Bible. So I knew nothing about it. 
And so he came, and we sat out on the living room floor. He said, now, what do you guys want to study? Well, you can imagine what most of them said. I didn't know what to say because I didn't know anything about the Bible. And he said, uh, the guy said, well, we want to study Revelation. He said, good, we're going to study Romans. <laughs> and so we started in Romans verse by verse. And within two weeks, we got to Romans 1, 16 and 17, the same passage that Martin Luther came to. And the Lord opened my eyes and changed my life dramatically. I told my dad, I said, I don't, I don't want to go in the insurance business. I want to go to college and go in the ministry. He was pleased and disappointed. But Romans 1, 16 and 17, the just shall live by faith. When the gentleman explained that to me, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, worked in my heart and converted me to the gospel of Christ and changed my life dramatically. I've often said that if I were marooned on an island and could only take any portion of Scripture with me, I'd have a hard time trying to decide between the gospel of John and the book of Romans. Gospel of John, of course, is a theological uh, uh, explanation of the life of Christ, and the book of Romans is such an important book. So you can see my interest in, in this book. Now, uh, Bob asked me to give an introduction to Romans, so we're going to do that, and I'm going to throw a bunch of information uh, at you on the screen, so it'll be largely informational today. As we get into the Romans, Bob and I and the others well, we start preaching from the book of Romans, but this will be largely information to you. So we're going to start out by just asking some simple questions. First question, what is Romans? I usually start that, out, that question out when I start teaching Romans, maybe in a home study, because a lot of people have no idea. Well, Romans, here's what it is. It's an inspired letter, inspired by God, written by Paul the Apostle, originally written in Greek around 57 A.D., which later in 1227 A.D. was divided into 16 chapters, and in 1555 A.D., those chapters were divided into 433 verses. That's the book of Romans. Now, there's a story about uh, dividing the New Testament into, in, uh, you know, the Scriptures into verses. It seems that an individual was writing through a carriage across across the land, and every time he hit a bump, he marked a verse there. Now, you know in, study, in your study of the Scriptures, sometimes the chapter divisions and the verse divisions are, are really not where they ought to go. Most times they are. But anyway, uh, it's divided into 433 verses. Now, it was originally written on a scroll, and a scroll might have been 35 or 40 feet long, maybe two and a half, three feet tall. And so when the recipients received the, the letter, which was a valuable thing in those days, they would have to unroll it all the way in order to read it. And so that's the reason why I, I, normally at the beginning of these scrolls, they would tell you who it's from and who it's to. So you didn't have to unroll. You know, when you get a letter these days, the first thing you do is try to find out who it's from. Well, in those days, they would, they would tell you right at the beginning of the scroll, uh, who it's from, and who it's to. And so in verse 1 of chapter uh, 1, uh, Paul tells them who it's from. It's from Paul, an apostle uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 7, he tells us to, who it's to, to the, to the Christians at Rome. Another question, where was Paul when he wrote this letter? He was in Corinth on his third missionary journey. In a moment, we're going to be looking at a map, and I'll talk about his journeys. But just remember that on his third missionary journey. Who penned this letter for Paul? Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 16. We're going to look at a few verses in that passage. Romans chapter 16, verse 22. It says, I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now, you'll find uh, sometimes in, in Paul's letters that uh, he says, See with what large letters I write. Uh, so he, he will have penned a postscript. But in this case, Tertius was the one who actually penned uh, these 16 chapters, not by chapters, but penned a long letter to the Christians at Rome. Who took this letter? Who probably delivered the letter to the recipients? Look in, uh, in verse, uh, back in the same chapter, verses 1 and 2, chapter 16. 
For Paul says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church in St. Korea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and to give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people, including me. And so, because of those verses, most folks believe that uh, Lydia was the one who actually carried this scroll uh, to the Roman Christians. Who were the recipients of this letter? Well, Paul tells us in chapter 1, verse 7, that they were the Christians at Rome, to all God's beloved in Rome. Now, let me just tell you a little bit about the city of Rome at this time. It was very much like uh, New York is to the United States or, or uh, London is to Great Britain. It was a very large city. It was estimated to have uh, maybe a million, 200,000, up sometimes some people estimate up to two, 2 million people. Uh, it was a very hilly uh, area, had small winding roads, uh, very, very narrow winding roads. Uh, it had uh, basically two different classes of people. There were no middle class to speak of. You had the, the emperors and, and all of their families and so forth, and then you had uh, tons of, of very poor people. There were very few middle class folks in, in Rome at that time. Many of the people lived off of welfare. Of course, this was the capital city of the Roman Empire, and uh, so they, they taxed a lot of people out in their empire, and all that money would be brought back into the city of Rome. And so, much like in our day, there were lots of people living off of welfare and very idle people with not much to do. Uh, there were palatial estates for the, for the various emperors. And the homes there... Uh, were mostly in kind of a slum area. Uh, in fact, they they would build homes on top of each other. And later on, there was a there was a large fire and it burned up many of those homes. Uh, but there may be as many seven homes built up on top of each other, many many seventy feet high, in in Paul's day. Uh, Nero became the emperor of Rome and uh, the Roman Empire in 54 A.D. And he, and he was that, uh, held that position until 68 A.D. Nero was a very immoral person. Uh, he uh, would have sexual relations with anything and whatever. Uh, he was a very uh, mean person. He killed many, many people. He, uh, he would just murdered people for no reason. Matter of fact, one time he, his wife was pregnant and he kicked her to death. And so he was a, a very... Uh, immoral, bad individual. At one point, he began to uh, persecute the Christians. And one of the things that he would do, he had these real nice gardens scattered throughout Rome, and he would roll Christians in oil or tar and put them on a pole and light them up to provide light for his gardens. And so uh, this is what some of the Christians had to undergo in Rome. So the Christians later on were really severely persecuted by Nero. There was a great fire in this city. Uh, a lot of folks think that Nero actually started it, that he wanted to burn up a large area in order to, to build some palatial more palaces and so forth, but uh, there's not much proof that he actually started it. But anyway, a large part of Rome burned, and uh, Nero, uh, to get back to Christians, uh, blame the Christians for putting uh, Rome on fire. They, we really don't know what started it. Well, anyway, uh, those are th that was kind of the situation that Paul was writing into when he wrote to the Christians at Rome. Now, who were these Christians? Well, I want you to look in chapter 16. Uh, we'll learn about some of the Christians that Paul is writing to here in Rome. We'll begin in chapter 16, verse 3. And I'm reading from the uh, NIV. He says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. So here's a couple who had previously been in Corinth. If you, if you study the book of Corinthians, you'll find their names mentioned in the book of Acts. Uh, and they are now in Rome. So these are some of the believers that Paul is writing too. And he also says, read also the church that meets at their house. And so Paul is going to mention a number, of, actually 28 individuals here in this 16th chapter, and he's going to 
probably mention five house churches. That's, you know, they didn't have church buildings like we do. Uh, they didn't have synagogues, and so the, the Christians would, would have to meet in house churches. And so he probably mentions five house churches in the 16th chapter. He says, Greet my friend Epinatus, who was the first convert of Christ in the province of Asia. Now you can imagine being the first Christian in a whole province. Uh, in 1954, following my first year of college, right after I'd become a Christian, uh, I went to work in a, in a farm up near Chicago. Uh, and when I was in my, that year, that t time of the year, or that time in my life, I could probably make $25 a week here in Arkansas. And I found out I could make $200 uh, a week working on a farm up in Chicago. So I took my little black trunk and I got on the train. I went to uh, south of Chicago. And I didn't realize that they worked you seven days a week, 18 to 20 hours a day. And uh, I, uh, I didn't, didn't have any fellow Christians to, to spend time with. And the folks they'd bring out on the farm were pretty rough customers from Chicago. And uh, I nearly starved together, uh, starved to death spiritually. And so I realized what it was like outside of a church. And so here is this man, Epinetus, who was the very first convert in the whole province of Asia. Anyway, he's in Rome now, and Paul is, uh, is one of the individuals he's writing this letter to. He says, Greet Mary, who worked very hard for you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives. And so Paul, I won't go through this whole chapter, uh, this uh, whole section because of time, but Paul, these are some of the people that Paul is writing to. You can go back later and read uh, this chapter and see the individuals and the churches that Paul is writing this letter to. Now, let's talk about the value and importance of Romans. No other portion of the Bible so completely or systematically sets forth the great doctrinal structure of the Christian faith as does Paul's letter to the Romans. Now I want to list uh, what uh, other great men of the faith have said about Romans. Now these are some of the reformers that uh, uh, that Paul uh, that uh, Bob talked about. Uh, talk about some of the great theologians who've written through the years and some of the distinguished authors. First one is Martin Luther. Bob mentioned Luther. Here's what Luther had to say about Romans. This letter is the chief book of the New Testament. It deserves not only to be known word by word for, by every Christian, but to be the subject of the meditation day by day. It is the light and way into the whole Scriptures. John Calvin said, When anyone understands this letter, he has a passage open to him to the whole understanding of the Scripture. Samuel Coleridge says, It is the most profound work ever written. F. B. Meyer says, It is the greatest and richest of all the apostolic works. Frederick Godet, who wrote a commentary on Romans, says, The Protestant Reformation occurred as a result of the study of Romans and Galatians. And Garden Clark, who wrote an introduction to our book on Romans and also wrote a small commentary on Romans, said, it is the most profound of all the letters and perhaps the most important book of the Bible. Floyd Hamilton, who also wrote a commentary on Romans, calls it the greatest book in the Bible. And then James I. Packer, uh, who's best known for his Knowing God plus many other uh, important works, uh, says this about Romans. There is one book in the New Testament which links up with almost everything that the Bible contains. That is, the letter to the Romans. Paul brings together and sets out in systematic relation all the great themes of the Bible. Then he mentions some of the th those themes covered in Romans. Now just think, all these, all these things he's mentioned are actually covered in systematic fashion in the book of Romans. Sin, law, judgment, faith, works, grace, justification, sanctification, election, the plan of salvation, the work of Christ, the work of the Spirit, the Christian hope, the nature and life of the church, the place of Jews and Gentiles and the purpose of God, 
the philosophy of church and of world history, the meaning and message of the Old Testament, the duties of Christian citizenship, the principles of piety and ethics. And he adds, from the vantage point given by Romans, the whole landscape of the Bible is open to view, and the broad relation of the parts to the whole becomes plain. The study of Romans is the fittest starting point for biblical interpretation and theology. That's how important the book of Romans is uh, to us and to all who would be reading the Scriptures. Now I want to talk about the author, the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to throw some facts and probabilities in front of you very, very quickly. Uh, first of all, Paul was born about 4 B.C. You know, Jesus uh, was born about 4 or 5 B.C. Most people think he was born at 0 B.C., but they made a mistake and found out that he was born about 4 or 5 B.C., and so Paul and Jesus were born about the same time. Paul was uh, from Tarsus, a coastal city of great commerce. If you look at the Mediterranean Sea and you go to the northwest corner, Tarsus was just uh, slightly above that. He had both a Jewish and a Gentile name. His Jewish name was Saul, and his uh, Gentile name was Paul. He had a very strict religious upbringing. He was a Pharisee and the son of a Pharisee. His home would have been very austere. His family would have, would have very strong religious uh, views. He probably spoke at least three languages. Uh, Hebrew, which is the language of the Old Testament. A Greek, the language of the, of the New Testament. And Syriac, in which part of the Old Testament was written in. He would practice all the uh, Jewish ceremonial washings. He would fast twice a week. He would observe all the Jewish laws of the Sabbath. And by the way, there were over 600 minute laws just dealing with with work and non-work on the Sabbath. And so Paul would, as he was growing up, would try to observe every one of those laws. Was probably a very proud person, being a Pharisee. Most of them are very full of pride. Was probably a very small person. Uh, the scriptures indicate that he was not much to look at. Probably had very poor eyesight because he met, writes in, in some of the letters that see with what large letters I write was very fervent, zealous for God. He advanced in Judaism. At age 5, he would probably begin to read the Old Testament. At age 10, he would probably be instructed in the oral law. At age 13 to 16, he would be sent to Jerusalem to train under a rabbi. He studied under Gamaliel, who was the leading scholar of Paul's day. He learned to trade probably under his father. And he worked with a kind of goat skin, not goat hair, as a mistake. Worked uh, with a goat hair and making leather goods and probably tents. He probably had a seat on the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the supreme court of the land uh, among the Jews. And uh, he had the final say-so with regard to most matters, including religious. As such, he would have a vote on the death penalty for individual Christian believers. He was considered a hit man against the believers. He probably never married although some people believe that he was married. In fact, in Philippians, he said he counted the loss of all things for this passing worth of knowing Christ. And some people read in that that he, that he uh, maybe lost his wife as a result of his Christianity, but uh, most people believe he was probably never married. He had a brilliant mind. He knew the Old Testament. He knew people. He knew the human heart. You pick this up as you, as you read his letters. He knew the laws of his society. He knew the customs of society. He knew the philosophies of his society. He knew poetry. He was a brilliant thinker. Now, I point, all this because, point out all this because God was, uh, was really working in Paul's life from the time he was a small child. In fact, we're told in Galatians, before he was even born, God had his plan for him to making him apostle to the Gentiles. But, but God was, was equipping Paul for the great work that he was going to be called to do. And so uh, Paul was, then Paul was miraculously converted by Christ on the road to Damascus. You're, most of you will be familiar with that story. He became a witness to Christ's resurrection, was personally taught by Christ for perhaps three years. We read about that in Galatians. Was called by Christ as an apostle 
to evangelize the Gentiles all over the Roman world, much to the chagrin of the Jews. He wrote 13 and maybe 14 books of the New Testament. Some people believe that he wrote Hebrews, but most people do not think so. He spoke about, uh, he spent about 30 years evangelizing people and establishing churches all over the Roman Empire. He cared deeply for many individuals and churches across the Roman Empire. He suffered greatly, was involved in shipwrecks, spent a night and a day in the waters of the sea, uh, was threatened, beaten, imprisoned, in peril, uh, often without food, hunting like a criminal, and in need uh, often during his ministry. In fact, if you, if you want to read of some of the perils that Paul had to undergo, turn to, you don't do it now, but turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul lists many of the things that he undergo, had to undergo as a Christian. I used to read that and think, boy, how did he survive that? How did, he un, uh, how did he willingly continue on in the cause of Christ? And then as I began to study chronology, I realized that he wrote these letters on his third journey, which was right in the middle of his life. He had much more suffering to undergo as a believer. So when you read that passage in 2 Corinthians 11, you realize Paul has many years yet to, come, to go suffering for the cause of Christ. He was accused by others of teaching falsehood, preaching from wrong motives, and after people's money. In fact, he had to write 2 Corinthians just to defend himself from all those charges. Toward the end of his ministry, Paul was even abandoned by some of his co-workers. And you can imagine how that must have hurt him very deeply to have those people whom he invested his life into. And then in his hour of greatest need, you read about in 2 Timothy chapter 4, to be abandoned by some of those. Yet Paul stood on the gospel, stood firm on the gospel to the very end of his life. During his 30 or more years, he established many churches, God used him to bring many to faith in Christ, and he trained and discipled many people. Paul loved people, he loved Christ, yet he was taken to Rome and executed for preaching the gospel and preaching about Christ's resurrection. Most of his life can be summed up uh, by looking at his uh, missionary journeys, and that's what I want to do here now. So we're going to see a map on the, on the screen. I want to point out some things to you. And the whole purpose is to, is to locate where Paul was and uh, where Rome was. This is the Roman Empire. You see all around the Mediterranean Sea, they had taken captives from all these people. And you can see Paul's journeys here. The first one is the light yellow. Paul was... Uh, had uh, located right here in, in Antioch, and uh, uh, Paul was sent out by the church on his first missionary journey. He traveled uh, this, this way uh, through Cyprus and came up in what's called Lower Galatia, and then he traveled back to Antioch and uh, gave a report to the church there. Now, I've gone over this with some of you, but uh, some of you have not, so I won't give you a real easy way to remember Paul's letters and to relate them to the book of Acts. So when you're reading the book of Acts and reading the letters, you know actually what's happening in Paul's life and what's going on in Christianity at that time. Uh, the first journey, which I just outlined, lasted one and a half years. And uh, when he got back, he wrote one letter. Anybody care to guess what that letter was? Galatians, right? So he just traveled through established churches and preached the gospel up here. Here's Galatia, and this is considered Lower Galatia. And so he got back to Antioch and gave a report, and word came to him that false teachers had uh, come in behind him at Galatia and were preaching a different gospel. And so Paul writes that very explosive letter uh, to them and saying, I'm astonished that you're uh, listening to a different gospel. And let him who preaches a different gospel be accursed. And so Paul was very angry at what was going on. And so Paul finishes his first missionary journey. Now, way to remember that, first journey, it was one and a half years, and he wrote one letter following that journey. So one, one, one. Now, that's covered in Acts 13 and 14. So if you read Acts 13 and 14, you know what's going on. Paul is on his missionary journey journey. 
along with uh, Barnabas. Well, when they get back to Barnabas, they get ready. I mean, get back to Antioch. They get ready to take a mission, another journey, and they have a, a dispute. Uh, Barnabas wants to take his cousin John Mark with him, but John Mark had turned back on the first missionary journey, and so Paul says, "No, we're not going to take him with us." Well, in God's providence, God used that dispute, and it was a genuine dispute in bringing the gospel to Cyprus, because Barnabas took John Mark. And they went down to Cyprus, and Cyprus became a, a Christian, uh, an island full of Christians. But Paul gathered Silas, and they took off on their second journey, which is the purple. And so they, they take off from Antioch again, go through Galatia, and go over here to Macedonia. They come down to Corinth, go over to Ephesus, sail back to, uh, to Caesarea and Jerusalem, and complete their, come back up to Antioch, their home church. And that completes their second missionary journey. Now, the way to remember that is it took it lasted two and a half years. And while Paul was on that journey, he wrote two letters. Anybody care to guess what th those letters were? First and Second Thessalonians. Paul had established church up here in Thessalonica, and so Paul on this journey writes letters, uh, a letter to the Thessalonians. Actually, two of them. And so the way to remember that, his second journey lasted two and a half years, and he, he wrote uh, two letters. Okay, one, 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 two, two, two. You can remember that. Now, that's found in Acts 15.36 to 18.22. Now, Paul starts off on a third journey, began leaving Antioch. It's in the yellow here. So Paul... Uh, Starts right here. He goes back and visits, uh, comes around this way and comes up back this way, comes back here, comes back to, uh, to he comes to, to Corinth right here. Then he comes back down to Caesarea and Jerusalem, and then he goes back up to Antioch, completes his third journey. Now, the importance of this particular journey is that Paul was here in Corinth, and he writes this letter to the Christians here at Rome, which becomes the Roman letter. And Paul says, look, I've, I've always wanted to come visit you. I've, I've heard about your faith, and I want to be in, mutually encouraged, and I want to reap some harvest among you. And so Paul's desire, he says, for a long time is to come to Rome and preach the gospel and fellowship with the Christians there. Well, he planned it, but it didn't happen. So he goes back to Antioch, gives a report. Well, he actually, excuse me, he comes back to Caesarea, and he's arrested. And he's put in jail, and he spends two years in jail in Caesarea. And uh, the Jews are about to have him put to death, so he appeals to Caesar. Well, Paul was a Roman citizen, and he appealed to Caesar, and when he appealed to Caesar, they said, to Caesar you shall go. And so they after they took him out of prison and they put him on board ship and you can see this uh, dark uh, dark orange. He sails from this area, well he goes up this way, sails this area, comes this way, comes below Crete, comes over to Malta, the ship breaks up over here. He and the total of 176 people on board ship it breaks up. They manage to make it to Malta. He eventually comes to Rome as a prisoner. And so Paul's desire to come to Rome to preach the gospel is finally realized. And so, uh, but Paul didn't come quite the way he expected. He came as a, uh, as a prisoner. Now, the way to remember this journey, and by the way, it's recorded in Acts 27 and 28. The way to recall, record this journey is that he spent two years in prison and in Rome, and two year in Rome, two years in prison in Caesarea. That's a total of four years, so that's his fourth journey. But I forgot to mention on the third journey. The third journey, he wrote three letters, and it lasted three and three quarter years. And so he wrote First and Second Corinthians and Romans on his third journey. Now his fourth journey, four years, two years in prison in Caesarea, two years in prison in Rome. That's four years, and he writes four letters while he's up here in Rome. He writes what's called the prison letters. 
Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And then he's released from his first Roman imprisonment. While he's released, he writes First and Second, uh, uh, First Timothy and Titus. And then he's suddenly rearrested, taken back to Rome. And just before he's executed, he writes his last letter, which is Second Timothy. And so that kind of, it completes Paul's life. Uh, but the thing I want you to see is that Paul was here in Corinth, and he finally writes this letter to the Christians here in Rome, pre preparing his way for the visit, which he, he, he gets to come to them in an all-expense-paid trip by the Roman government. Quite unexpected. Okay. So that'll tell you a little bit about... Uh, now, real quickly, the time we've got left, let me, let's just talk about Romans. I want to give you uh, uh, the uh, theme of Romans. The theme of Romans is justification by faith and its consequences. Justification simply means be declared right. We will develop that uh, in the first eight chapters of the book of Romans. So remember that the theme is justification by faith and its consequences. Let me give you the overall structure of Romans, first of all, in three divisions. First, one's, first eight chapters, justification by faith. Paul begins that in Romans 1, 16 and 17, where he talks about the just shall live by faith, and he completes that concept of justification in, in Romans chapter 8, verse uh, 37 to 39, where he basically says that nothing in all creation will separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so chapters 1 through 8, we're going to be dealing with justification by faith. In chapters 9 through 11, we have the problem of the Jews and, the, and of the Gentiles. Uh, at this time, the Jews had rejected Christ, and God had rejected them, and God had now was going to the Gentiles and bringing them, uh, the Gentiles, to faith in Christ. And so that's what Paul deals with in chapters uh, 9 through 11. And then in chapters 12 through 16, Paul deals with practical matters and personal greetings. He begins chapter 12 with the words, Therefore, I beseech you by the mercies of Christ that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before the Lord. Someone has written that the problem with living sacrifices is they always want to crawl off the altar. <laughs> but Paul begins to tell us here how we're to live out that justification by faith. Now let me give you a little more detailed structure of Romans. In chapter 1, verses 3 to 20, Paul tells us that all mankind are sinners are in need of a Savior. In chapter 1, verse 18 to 32, he tells us about the Gentiles being lost and undone and without a Savior. In chapter 2, he talk, turns to the Jews, said, You, if you call yourself a Jew and do the very same things, you yourself show yourself to be sinners in need of the gospel. And then in chapter 3, the passage that Bob mentioned, he throws us, lumps us all together and says, There is not one good, not even one. And so Paul, first of all, establishes the need for the gospel before he turns to the gospel. Then in chapter 3, verse 21 to chapter 8 through 39, Paul systematically deals with the great doctrines of the Christian faith, salvation, sacrifice, atonement, propitiation, justification, imputation, sanctification, mortification of sin, the work of the Holy Spirit, predestination, eternal security, and others. Now, some of those are big words, and as we, as we spend the next number of months going through them, we'll, we'll explain some of those big words if you don't know what they are. Chapters 9 to 11, again, he talks about the, uh, it gives us a definitive answer as to the matter of the Jews and the Gentiles. In chapter 9, he gives us the eternal reason because of God's purpose of election, God had chosen at this time to reject the Jews and include the Gentiles into his kingdom. So he gives the eternal reason. In chapter 10, he turns to the present reality, and that is that the Jews are rejecting the gospel and the Gentiles are turning to faith in him. And then in chapter 11, he talks about what's going to happen in the future. And he basically tells us that God has not forgotten his chosen people, and some date he's going to turn back to them when the full number of the Gentiles come in, 
and there will be a great conversion of the Gentiles, I mean of the Jewish people at that time. Then in chapter 12, he urges us to present our bodies as living sacrifices, exercising our spiritual gifts in love, serving one another. And so Paul deals with our spiritual gifts, and with love, uh, uh, privilege and responsibility of loving one another and so forth. In chapter 13, Paul reminds us that we're to be subject to governing authorities. We're in, all government, he says, instituted by God, and as Christians, we're under that rule to be subject to them. Chapters 14 and 15, he instructs us as to how the weak and the strong Christians are to regard each other. Uh, some people believe he's talking about the Jews and Gentiles. I personally believe he's talking about all types of people. And the weak here are the, those who are weak of knowledge about Christianity, and the strong are those who are strong in knowledge of Christianity. And then in chapter 16, Paul sends uh, greetings to 28 people and possibly five home churches in Rome. He sends along greetings from eight people. He gives them a final warning about false teachers and closes this masterful letter with a doxology praising God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In short order, what does, what does Paul in Romans want us to know? All right, let me give you seven things, simple but profound truths. This really summarizes what Romans is all about. First of all, we're all sinners and each one of us is in need of Christ. Second, Christ saved us by a perfect sacrifice. Third, we can only come to Him by faith. That has always been true and will always be true. And He's, He uses David and Abraham as an example to show that this is not a new doctrine. This is what they believe. Fourth, God's wrath has now been turned away from us. Five, though in this life we will always struggle with sin, we are promised that there is therefore now no condemnation, and our salvation is absolutely sure. And aren't you glad of that? Six, God has not abandoned the Jews, His chosen people. They will be brought to faith in Christ at a later date. And number seven, as a result of God's mercy to us, we're all to li live together harmoniously, sacrificially, serving one another for the glory of Christ. That, in a nutshell, is what Romans is all about and what we're going to spend the next few months looking into. And those truths are, ex are exactly what we celebrate as we observe the Lord's Supper. Bob, you want to come? I do. Thank you, Curtis. Would you all thank Curtis for taking us through that?